Good afternoon. So after lunch, I think that it is important to speak a little about um, major of taxation on wealth. I see that most people have a concern on this because I believe that you all have to deal with uh, wealth. First, I'm going to speak about our guest speaker, Luca Stankiewicz. He is a full professor of law at the University of Jean Moulin Lyon III, where he started his career in 2010, and he experienced a cover of several courses in tax and public finance, and his research concentrates on international tax and uh, tax procedures. And he is also a specialist from the same university and also diploma certificates in uh, French law as well as uh, Polish and uh, English law from the Warsaw University and Cambridge University. He has delivered courses and conferences and has published several papers in French and English in several publications. He also taught at the School of Law of the University of Sao, of Sao Paulo in Hungary and the UK. In France, he's also a member of the Scientific Committee of the IFA and is also a member of ITLP and IBDT. As to Ricardo Maris, he, there is no need to introduce him. He is from the University of Sao Paulo, a specialist in civil law, and our president of IBDT. And also, he is a member of uh, several uh, institutions like ABDF, AFS, and DT. I think that there is no need to introduce uh, his curriculum. Isabel Calis da Fonseca has a, mo has a Master's of Laws, a PA, um, Doctors of Law from the University of London, and is a, speci a specialist in tax law, and also a member of IFA and STEP, and partnered at the office of AJRSA. Rodrigo Maet is also a great professor and also a doctor's degree from USP and former counselor or judge from CNT and director professor of international tax law and also a member of the legal council of Seduscon and Ibradin. Partner of Dias Canedo Advogados. So I pass the floor to Fernanda, who will be the moderator of this session, also a debater. She is a master's degree candidate at ABDT and also has a graduate course from the foundation of Yetulu Vargas. And so she has the floor to speak a little bit more about this. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. I would like to thank the coordination of this Congress for the opportunity to moderate this rich debate and also that at the same time is controversial. Thank you for all the assistance. Uh, thank you for coming to this debate because this is a Friday afternoon. I know how difficult it is to be here. And you can scan, scan the QR code on the screen for you to pose your questions. We're going to have uh, three talks, and for a certain time, the QR code will be un unavailable. But hopefully, in the end of this panel, we will send the questions uh, to the speakers. A couple of explanations about the structure of this panel. We're going to have uh, two rounds of a debate. On the first one, Professor Ricardo will speak about the controversies and difficulties on the domestic law in Brazil with legal consequences related to trusts that are constitu constituted abroad involving Brazilian residents. And then also, as a debater, we have Professor Lucas, who will also speak about the French experience in the taxation of trusts and explain the complexity of a civil law country, especially when we have this legislate when we have to consider legislation of these countries. And then we're gonna start a second round of debate and then we'll be speaking of well, we start with Isabel and then Professor Rodrigo about taxation of wealth. 
which is something that is a heated topic right now, especially after Brazil has launched earlier this year a proposition to tax wealth as a way to fund climate change and poverty initiatives. And also I would like to hear the experience from France, especially from Dr. Lucas. And in this round, we also gonna hear from Lu Dr. Lucas how taxation occurs in France or taxation on wealth. So without much ado, let's start the first round with Professor Ricardo. And nine months ago, we have the law that was passed to discipline the taxation of wealth that are owned by Brazilian residents. And of course, this has legal consequences for trusts established abroad when it involves individuals, residents in the country. And of course, uh, this will go through several tests in the Brazilian uh, legal system. So what types of controversies do you, do you think that will arise out of this, especially with regard to this topic? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Professor Lucas, to be here. <coughs> Trust is a type of a contract or an agreement that works in or that is signed in the private sphere. It is an instrument for succession and asset protection. So in terms of personal relations, this is a very interesting instrument. It has several modalities and it varies from country to country. It even from state to state like in the United States. But it, in terms of taxation, things really get complicated. This is not a problem only in Brazil. It's also seen in many other places. And this is because a specific circumstance is involved in it. Because the property goes from a settler to the trustee who has an asset and he has full availability or management of that asset because or aiming future objectives that established by the trustee or oh, sorry by the settler or any other instrument that usually exists so therefore this is a property that is given no it's not a donation the settler does not donate anything to the trustee. It is, or the asset, or part of this asset is given to the trust as established in the deed. We have something similar in Brazil that you won't know, which is the trustee. So, it is uh, similar to the trust, and is there is also ownership that goes ownership of assets that goes uh, to the trust through the trustee, with the purpose of in the future to benefit the beneficiary. But as to the trust, you know, now considering the tax law in Brazil. We have a couple of questions, especially with regard to the law that we have. That simply, simply, simply saying, it states that the property or ownership of the assets is uh, or belongs to the settler, and establishes that in the future, when the asset is transferred uh, to the beneficiaries. So this act is either by donation, if it is, is it still during the living existence of the settler, or by succession, if after the death of the settler. The law does not establish anything related to levying of um, TCMDC, which is the tax by, uh, for 
causa mortis. This is this is the tax on of property on donation. And then there is, but is the federal law can also re can tax this kind of transaction, like uh, donations and succession after death of a person. It's a curious question because Law 14757 is not a complementary one, so this is not uh, this is not in the Constitution. However, the Constitution grants uh, the Union the power or the competence or the exclusive competence to regulate private sector or private law. And when this law establishes that there will be a donation at a certain point as a result of uh, a succession upon the death of the settler, then establishes a private law right which it resonates in the field of uh, state taxation, which happens as any other tax. If we, wouldn't, if we didn't have that law, it would work this way precisely because of the effects of the contract of a trust or the trust contract. So we know that economic life is, is governed by private law and then it captures all the ability of a collection in this uh, economic means that is governed by private law, and then this is taxed, or any tax that uh, applies to it. But of course, uh, this can result from a contract or a legal provision. And if there is a foreign law, as the trust law agreements are, so this law, in, the, in Brazil established that the foreign law will govern all the obligations resulting from this contract and also established that all the assets or the existing or the assets in a foreign country will also be added to that. So there is no problem so far. So far we haven't had any kind of trust or discipline uh, including the Brazilian law, but for many years there has been a number of trusts and of course, uh, there are taxes resulting from this. So these laws, 14754, was not, did not invent anything. It virtually transformed into something legal what really results from this agreement in general. Of course, because there are some different modalities or different situations. So personally, I understand that the provisions of law 14754 do not really conflict with or do not overlap the state laws with regard to that. There is no law speaking of any taxable event or taxes. It just states that in the private world, the personal relations will take, th there will be there a donation made in the case of succession, in the case of a death of a settler. And it's curious to say that the law has not is established anything that during, over the duration of this agreement, that there is any incident. For example, oh, sorry, there is nothing left on that. So for example, any tax, just because there is a previous trust existing there. I say that because at the time when the law was enacted, there were many questions raised, especially because of a taxable event. Now let's move on. Now let's think about income tax. What we have in the law, it states that the settler continues to be the owner of the, those assets and the, he must pay the income tax on the income or, or the asset generated by the trust since 2024 onwards. And it also states it states that, well, I got lost, sorry. I just got lost. But it also states that the settler continues to be the owner and also or better say, he is still 
has to pay in tax on the trust. Hmm. And something that might be in the minds of everyone, is this possible? Under our legislation and our tax regime, is it possible because income tax is reported under the principle of the income realization so or availability of this income without income there is a no tax levied so the question is the settler delivers his asset to the trustee and does he have any availability from that moment onwards he, well, I'm just saying this in general, right, because there are particular situations. But in general, from that moment onwards, the settler cannot exercise the attributes of that property. What are they? Use it, enjoy, and disposing that, protecting. And the seller cannot do anything at all. He can issue a letter of intention or the famous uh, letters of wishes say I wish it would be this way this way it should be managed this way or that but the one who has full powers on this is the trustee and the trustee is the one who really gets the income which is not for himself or herself but he has this availability or they are available to him so this is the possibility of uh, having uh, tax, uh, something taxable on the seller. And law 14745 establish establishes that the settler must demand or require from the trustee uh, as, it will, as it should be on the deed the handover of the resources necessary to pay the income tax. And so Will this solve the problem, or does it just eliminate the barrier of the CTN for taxation purposes? I have my doubts. I'm not just going to state anything firmly here, but I believe that this is not really the situation that Article 45, Article 45 I ICTM establishes. That article establishes or defines the uh, taxpayer of the income tax as being the holder of the economic or legal availability of the income. That's the taxpayer. Now, it could also establish the settler as being the one accountable for that, according to you know, tax uh, replacement, as we usually say. But it couldn't. Because who would be the taxpayer? It could be the trustee, because he is the one uh, receiving the income. But this is out of the Brazilian border, so this is not under the scope of the Brazilian law. So I see no possibility of either Cata establishing that what the law has for the settler has been something that is under that that should be taxable to the settler. I don't see this possibility. And the law did not understand it because it, the law sets forth that the asset still belongs to the settler. Therefore, the law understand that the settler is the taxpayer. Curious because the, the settler has no, avail dispo no availability of the income according to Article 40, 25 of CTM as sets forth where the one where you identify the individual that is the taxpayer or legal or income availability or any sort of income arising from it. So we have certain obstacles here. Um, what, what is increased because it's a multiplicity of trustee uh, uh, broad when we go to the law 14 7 and 4 it appoint the main figures of trust who are trustees settlers and it's uh, defining all the main entities 
So it is based in the model of trust, which I say is quite similar, if not equal and similar to the Convention of AYA, about trusts. But in truth, and actually, many times, I would dare to say most, uh, almost half of the, uh, the times, according to what I've noticed, is that this model is not followed on the contract, trust and that contract, this, that, and the other contract. We have trusts, as an example. We have those trusts where the settler does not reside in Brazil. It is resident abroad. We have trusts whereupon the, the we don't have the settler. There are trusts with no settler. Where the trustee does a declaration of trust. And trustee establishes the trust. So we have those situations where upon the asset under the trust to reach its purpose, that it's legitimate, and we know trust many times are used for for abuse, to abuse for for the trust, the legitimate ones. There are those that set forth hurdles that you cannot overcome for trustees and all those involved in to resort and grab the resources or the resources like the asset has to stay there because in the future they want to be handed down to grandchildren children so forth i personally know a case where you don't know who will be the beneficiaries of that trustee because the beneficiaries of the trust will only be when a future uncertain event takes place and not the current generation of children, grandchildren of a settler, someone involved with the trust. Therefore, in addition to the first problem that I shared here, perhaps it's possible to collect taxes on it, according to what I the taxable event in Brazil for this tax. We have in practice, even those who want to comply with the law, huge difficulties. This is because except for those whom the trust model is equal to the one that's foreseen according to the law, several other ways of doing a trust that we know, how are they going to do it? Well, of course, the beneficiaries, they uh, not even they might ha be aware of it, but what happens is, anyhow, see the fall. This is an one more point that we have those scenarios in practical life that are really weird, even for those who want to comply by the law. So no, I'm not preaching, let's uh, resort to courts and not comply by the law, but I'm saying, as Fernanda said, we will have several situations resorting to courts with the absolute uncertain outcomes. We, I believe, the universe of those here, we all have the habit of giving opinion regarding tax law based on a technique of interpretation, knowledge of tax law principles. Unfortunately, we don't find that much in courts. Therefore, this means that the future for trusts is quite conflictuous. L I'm sorry I'm not able to provide more precise information. There's no co competence for this purpose, but I thank your attention. <laughs> Professor Ricardo, thank you very much. Now I invite Professor Lucas to talk about the compared legislation in France. We know for 13 years, at least, it was established the mandatory to inform trust for those individuals living abroad. And France in faces deba debates regarding domestic coherence regarding these legal effects attributed to trust. Could you please talk a bit the French experience and what would be the most controversial points on the subject. 
Thank you, Fernanda. To start, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to be here today. Thank you, Professor Schweri, the chairman, Ricardo Maris, Luis Fabio, Rodrigo Maite, and for the panelists, and Fernanda for the perfect coordination of this panel. And it's always a pleasure for me to come back to Sao Paulo. This is the fifth time I'm here in this University of Law. Unfortunately, my Portuguese does not allow me to deliver a conference in Portuguese. Therefore, now I'll switch into English. So switching now to English, um, well, the aim of my contribution uh, is to illustrate um, on the example of, fr of France, the difficulty of applying the tax system of a civil law country to trust, and we've got very much the same issues which um, arise in France, like in Brazil, except certainly for the federalism issues which uh, we uh, do not experience as, as, as much as you. Uh, so trusts obviously are unknown to French law in the sense that they cannot be created under f French law, like in Brazil. However, foreign trusts produce, produce legal effects in, in, in France. So inboundly, they can hold French assets, and in, outboundly, and this is what I will talk about, is uh, that French residents can be settlers or uh, beneficiaries of foreign trusts. There's never been a coherent body of law in France concerning taxation of trusts, foreign trusts, even if an important reform was enacted in 2011. Well, this reform introduced uh, wholly new and specific rules regarding the inheritance and gift taxes and also the annual wealth tax regarding trusts. It also uh, introduced mandatory uh, trust reporting scheme, but it would be misleading to say that it coherently reformed the way France taxes foreign trusts in, gen in general what should be stressed rather is that um, this law, 2011, has been adopted in the middle of the financial crisis with a stated objective to curb tax evasion. And, uh, and the parliamentary report, uh, which uh, was issued to um, justify the, uh, the law, said something like this, 80% of world tax evasion uh, goes through trusts. Whether it's not true or not, I will, I will not discuss, probably not, but uh, clearly this gives you the, well, the, the, the context of the adoption of the, um, of the text. So the, in France, uh, uh, without much coherence, the approach remains proper to each tax and exemplifies a phenomenon that we refer to in France as autonomy of tax law vis-à-vis -vis private law. A French professor, Jean-Pierre Legal, has brilliantly summarized this approach in, uh, with regard with to trusts when commenting on the 2011 Act. He said this, the legal reality of trusts is largely ignored. For each tax concerned, the trust is stereotyped, reconstructed in a totally artificial way, ignoring the rights between the assets and the parties involved in the trust. The French-style trust is totally disconnected from its substratum be it a revocable or irrevocable trust, discretionary or not, testamentary, grant or trust, whatever. So the only express across the board input of the um, 2011 Act is the definition of trust for all tax purposes. And this definition is in line with the Hague Convention that France, by the way, has uh, uh, signed but not ratified. And it is even broader, it can even encompass some legal arrangements other than trusts, such, such as in particular certain foundations of Liechtenstein. Well, given the, the time frame, I will have to focus on certain taxes only and on the uh, reporting scheme. So first with trust and income tax, uh, there exists since 1936 a specific provision in the code taxing proceeds, proceeds of trusts as income from securities, such as dividends or royalty uh, interests. The, that law aimed at allowing France to tax income from trusts 
that French residents could set up abroad to hold uh, stocks and shares. And here, everything works as if the trust were a foreign corporation that distributes a dividend to a French shareholder. So therefore, the trust income is taxed under a sort of entity approach with two main consequences. So first, as a rule, there is no current taxation of undistributed income, whatever the nature of the trust, grant or trust, accumulation, revocable, doesn't matter. Second consequence, the distribution of trust proceeds is in substance taxed as a dividend, whatever the nature of the income that the trust could have realized. So currently this treatment is favorable uh, because dividends today are taxed in France at a flat rate of 30% of, uh, of income taxes. It must be stressed that only proceeds are taxed and proceeds, produits, should be distinguished from the capital, namely the corpus of the trust. It means that if the trustee distributes the assets which were contributed by the settler, this is not income, and in practice it uh, requires that the trustee keep a form of accounting of the trust in order to distinguish between the two types of flows, between proceeds and capital. Now, as said, as a rule, and distributed income of a trust is not currently taxed in the hands of the beneficiaries, but this outcome can be reversed by the operation of a specific, what we have, a specific CFC-like rule for individuals, which were established in 1999, and the rule aims at taxing income accumulated in certain structures, including trusts, established outside of France where structures benefit from a privileged tax regime. And privileged means 60% uh, of the tax, uh, uh, less than 60% of the tax that would have been paid in France on the same income. So this is for the income tax incidents, so France taxes trust as entities for income tax purposes. And now uh, we move to inheritance and gift taxes. Uh, and uh, this was the main issue that was addressed by the uh, 2011 Act, so the uh, inheritance gift taxes and the annual wealth tax. Uh, since the taxable events of those taxes uh, are, are based on ownership, well, this is where most issues arise uh, uh, because of the uh, tension between the common law and, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, civil law concepts. Now, it must be stressed that uh, in France, the financial implications of inheritance and gift taxes may be very significant. Well, to my understanding, in Brazil, those taxes are state taxes, and the state of Sao Paulo levies a 4% inheritance tax. Well, for us, the French, well, this is almost a non-taxation. Uh, so in, 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 in France, the marginal rate in direct line can go up to 45%, and outside of direct line, it's 60% of inheritance tax. So th there's really, really an issue, a financial issue for the, uh, the taxpayers. So before 2011, the uh, application of uh, inheritance and gift taxes to trust depended on the possible characterization of the transfer through a trust as a gift or inheritance in the French sense. So obviously, obviously there can be no match uh, legally speaking, but the case law was willing to, uh, let's say, show some willingness to extend the concepts, especially that of an indirect donation, but clearly some trusts remained out of scope of taxation, and especially the irrevocable trusts that would not terminate upon the death of the settlers of the intergenerational, intergenerational uh, trusts. And now in sharp in sharp contrast with the uh, income tax rules, which are based on the entity approach, in inheritance and gift taxes, we use rather a transparency approach, a look-through approach, in the sense that the creation of a trust is a non-event, and that assets remain with the settler, whatever happens. 
So the new regime has now two branches. So first, the trust can be characterized as a gift or inheritance under French rules. Uh, so this is where the old rules carry forward. And two, the new rules is where the transfer cannot be characterized as a gift or inheritance in the French sense. And here the uh, new law introduces a new taxable event which occurs at the death of the settler. So the uh, taxable event occurs even if the assets remain in the trust, which may be the case for precisely the ir irrevocable intergenerational accumulation trusts, which continue despite the death of the settler. And to make sure that every single generation in a trust is subject to inheritance tax, the law introduces a new concept of the beneficiary deemed to be settler, so, or the deemed settler. So for the application of the rules, the beneficiary who paid the tax becomes the new settler for, um, for tax purposes. The taxing scheme which results thereof can be uh, highly uh, penalizing for the taxpayers. So first, uh, if, if the respective shares of the beneficiaries can be uh, determined, well, standard rules apply. The standard rules are harsh, by Brazilian standards, uh, but they are standard rules. However, if there is now a collective share that accrues to beneficiaries who are all descendants, but one cannot determine the precise share that would go to each beneficiary, when the settler or the deemed settler dies, a flat 40% rate is applied on the whole correct, uh, collective share. In other cases, a flat 60% rate applies, and this is a case whenever a collective part accrues to beneficiaries who are not descendants or an asset remains in the trust without being attributed to anyone at the moment of death. In addition to that, when the transfer cannot be characterized as an inheritance or gift, a flat 60% rate also applies when, uh, whenever the trustee is located in, in a non-cooperative jurisdiction, and that's the best, when the settler is a French resident and the trust was established after May 2011. So this provision, the last one, clearly aims at discouraging French residents from establishing certain trusts abroad, and I refer to intergenerational trusts which do not end up on the death of the, um, of the settler. But this provision seems unconstitutional to me, but it has not yet been tested before the constitutional court. So this is the inheritance tax. We also have an annual wealth tax in France. Um, and uh, we'll talk about it later as well. Um, and here, the 2011 Act has established another fiction, notwithstanding the nature of the trusts, which may even be irrevocable and discretionary, the assets are always taxed in the hands of the settler, so, or the deemed settler. Uh, the problem, obviously, is that the, uh, those, ben those settlers, but deemed settlers, uh, may not enjoy any benefit from the asset because they gave away control over it to the trustee, well, it does not matter. Uh, so certainly the Constitutional Court was um, uh, addressed the issue here, and it, it upheld the constitutionality of the rule, but with the reservation that the taxpayer be given the possibility of proving that the assets confer on him no direct or indirect ability to pay. But the counterproof seems almost impossible since the court added that uh, it, the counterproof cannot result exclusively from the irrevocable or discretionary nature of the trust, so I don't know how the counterproof may actually be brought. Lastly, uh, the 2011 Act also introduced a very harsh trust reporting scheme which falls on the trustee, which can be resident or non-resident in France with respect to any trust which in substance has some connection, connection to France. So the connection may, may consist just of assets in France 
or of a trustee in France or a settler or any beneficiary resident in France. The reportable obligation includes not only the information about the creation of the trust, but also you have an annual, annual uh, uh, declaration of the trust value that has to be um, uh, subscribed to every, uh, every year. Failure to comply results in a fixed sum penalty of 20,000 euro. And there used to be, alternatively, a proportional penalty of 12.5% of the asset value, of the value of the assets of the trust. But this one has been declared unconstitutional by the Constitutional Court as a disproportionate uh, penalty. So this is reporting. And in addition, a later 2013 act established a public register, a public register of trusts that would be, that, that was the aim, available to anyone via internet. Uh, the Constitutional Court, however, uh, declared it unconstitutional under the right to privacy. I mean, what was declared unconstitutional was the unrestricted access to the register, so the register remained, remains in place but is covered by tax secrecy. It must be mentioned here that in the EU, having a register of trusts or other legal entities is an obligation under the uh, fourth EU anti-money laundering uh, directive. Uh, but there was never any obligation to open the trust to register to the general public. Under, um, under this uh, scheme. And by the way, recently there was a case from the ECJ uh, saying that um, even for companies, the open access to the uh, uh, beneficial ownership uh, register is, um, uh, violates uh, the charter, your charter of fundamental rights. So to conclude, I'll take one minute to conclude with 17 minutes. Uh, so the problem for me with the French tax rules is not that they are autonomous tax rules uh, which depart from private law. We obviously do not have the same constitutional con constraints that Brazil uh, in this respect. And if you look at, at common law countries, in fact, the common law countries ha have since ages struggled tax-wise with the trusts since the Middle Ages as well. So, you know, to, to use a VAT customs law uh, analogy, a trust is a kind of a free port where potentially assets can remain forever uh, without triggering taxable events. So common law countries also address that issue. I mean, through private law, they uh, inserted the rule against perpetuities and also uh, uh, several uh, uh, provisions, anti-abuse provisions in tax law. Uh, can be found in the US or, or the UK particularly. But the problem with the French rules rather that they are probably, that they, they have the overkill capacity, they are too radical uh, in disregarding the legal nature of the trust and on some points lack uh, reason, reasonableness. And last remark, uh, with the French law and we, when you look at the Brazilian law and, or other, the UK laws for example, uh, we are clearly experiencing uncoordinating rules, un uncoordinated characterizations, which will necessarily result in cross-border double taxation. Thank you. Obrigada, Professor Lucas. Thank you, Professor Lucas. Thank you for being so on top of the, on top of this other dot. You know, you said that you're going to be very punctual. So I believe that the first round has been very successful. So we have addressed the difficulties and other some vices of domestic legislation that prevail in some countries and also some considerations or some comments on trust. And I think that this serves as an inspiration for this wonderful audience. So when you take this to the court, please do, just do that with a lot of details so that we can have a very case, good case law in the future. Now let's speak about the taxation on wealth. 
I just like to remind you that even though this kind of taxation is established in the Constitution, Constitution since 1988, it has never been regulated in Brazil. However, there are some recent researches, like one from the Instituto Data Senado in the early 2023, states that today 62% of Brazilians agree with taxation of wealth. And a more recent survey dated June 2024 from by Ipsos reveals that 69% of Brazilians support the idea of increasing taxation on wealth. And the percentage should be just like the ones of the, uh, the uh, G20 countries, which is 68%. And very few people agree that people should pay less taxes on their wealth. 50% uh, did not uh, give their opinion. And despite this uh, great appeal from the people and the idea of taxation on wealth, many countries have uh, quit the idea of having this tax or made things more flexible. And as we heard, as we're going to know about France. Isabel, let's start from your comments. What has been the most, uh, the experience internationally, what the most recent studies can show us with regard to taxation on wealth? And Rodrigo, if you can complement domestically, what have been the difficulties that government and national Congress may face if the opinion of the people is heard with regard to implementing IGF here? Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Professor Schroeder, Mr. Flavio and Rodrigo for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here and also be a part of this panel with Professor Ricardo and Lucas. It's a really a great pleasure. And thank you, Fernanda, for the coordination and Tatiana, too. We'll be speaking of the taxation on wealth or wealth tax. It is very appealing. So here, we're going to start by explaining the international context. And then I'm going to sp speak about the international experience. And Rodrigo will bring you a context about the current moment in Brazil according to the tax reform. I expect to leave you with more questions than answers, because this is how I feel with regard to this topic. Recent data have shown that today we have around 3,000 billionaires in the world. This means that the wealth of the, these people increased much more than the wealth of just an individual in the last years, since 1997. Why is it so? Well, we come to that later, but this is also explained um, by how these assets came to his, their ownership. And wealth generates inequality. For us to speak about inequality, we also have to consider the numbers. In this chart, if you see the bars, you can see by country, and the length covers 10% of the people in that country. We can see that 10% of the population in the U.S. has more than 70% of the wealth in the country, while 1% has more than 30% of that wealth. So you can see that the concentration of income is very dense. But this is no, not only in the U.S. You can also see that in all the countries listed here, apart from the U.S. and the U.K., all the other countries listed are ones that have already implemented the wealth taxation. We come to that when we discuss uh, the international experience. When we have a super rich people, what we have for this year is the following, a proposition that is multilateral proposed by the G20 on, be, uh, on upon request of Brazil. And Gabriel Zuckerman proposed his proposition that uh, two, they will have a 2% of their wealth would raise 
starting from millionaires with one billion dollars in wealth. And if we have this uh, tax rate of 2%, this will generate of $250 billion a year. So his proposition is that we're going to have a annual tax on the, bi on the assets of uh, billionaires around the world. For us, tax professionals, it's interesting how he suggests is implementing this taxation. The first one is that this taxation would mean deduction from the income tax paid by this person. Because he said that the wealth is so much bigger than the income that we can, we could do it that way. Now, implementation of this procedure will be the following. Under three suggestions, the this report is very preliminary. There are several issues open. And then you can see that it'll be very interesting whether we had a more in-depth approach to that. But what are the forms of implementation for wealth taxation, in his opinion, according to the multilateral perspective? So it will be a presumptive income taxation, because he says that this wealth grow, grew by 7.5% a year. He suggests that there is uh, this presumptive income taxation on the growth of that asset. Another way would be considering that a wealth taxation, then assume they're going to tax assets in countries where there is a legal uh, possibility of implementing these kinds of taxation. And lastly, another element that he poses as an alternative is to establish taxation on income, but he suggests that he will also broaden the concept of income, including the one that is non the unrealized income. From the legal and constitutional point of view, this will generate a lot of discussion. Now, we have this multilateral conversation, but from the individual perspective, what do we have? Other countries have already implemented this kind of wealth taxation. In 1990, there were 12 countries in, uh, under the OECD that had this kind of taxation. Austria, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, Finland, France, Iceland, Luxembourg, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and Spain. In 2017, we, this was reduced to four countries, France, Norway, Spain, and Switzerland. In 2024, there, there were only three. So the specific case of France will be explained by Dr. Lucas because it's very interesting. They changed the way how they have implemented this taxation. And why is it so? Because the taxation is now down to the immovable uh, property, and he will explain that later. Here, we only show how the number of countries in the OCD de decreased. So they have stopped implementing this uh, wealth taxation. Now, based on the experience of Norway, Switzerland, and Spain, what do we have? It is very difficult to compare this kind of taxation, because each one of these countries has a totally different regime from each other. And then, during implementation, when we see what is the type of asset that is uh, taxed, the exemptions that are different, if you go into tax the individual or the family unit, and what else is also relevant is the interaction of the wealth taxation with other ways of taxes that exists in that uh, current uh, taxing system. In Norway, there is no taxation of succession. In Switzerland, in turn, we don't have taxation of capital gain. And in Spain, there is a cap saying that if you have too much income tax return, you have a deduction to be applied to the tax on wealth. So the systems are very different. Another important issue to take into account is valuation of assets. 
This will serve as the basis to calculate the tax. If the company is closed, how can you value a network? All of this raises a lot of questions. We also have liquidity. So if a person has many immovable properties, how do you pay taxes? Would they have to sell the, the asset? You can make things easier saying that this can be paid in installments. But this is not a solution. It's difficult for you to implement this. And as to the rates, we believe that all of them will be reduced over time since uh, its implementation until the current moment. The last reduction was significant in Norway. Then when we see the effect that this, e e this tax uh, has to do with uh, the collect tax collection is that we can see that the collection is very little are very low. Norway has a better position compared to the other countries, but you know, collection in general is very low. Now, what is the situation in Latin uh, South American country? We also have some experience with that. On this chart, we can see a summary of the characteristics that we have effective here in Latin America. Argentina, for example, Bolivia, Uruguay, and Colombia. In, in Argentina, is in Uruguay, this implementation has been older. And the critics of this taxation sees, shows that, that they levy not only individuals that are resident, non-residents. And we also consider the asset that the non-residents will not have here in Uruguay and Colombia, what is also interesting is that uh, le what is levied on legal entities, not only individuals. Except for Uruguay, it is also levied on the global asset. In Uruguay, is only of uh, what is existing in Uruguay. And the basis is on the net asset. And what is this? The assets less the liabilities. And this does not happen in Argentina. And as to the exceptions, there are a number of them. So this is one of the major issues that we see when analyzing implementation of this taxation. Because the more taxable they are, the more the manifestation of the taxpayers in order not to pay so much in taxes. As we could see in the OECD countries, the tax rates have been diminishing over time. Now. When we see all these aspects, the conclusion is that the experience of the countries do not lead us to a conclusion, but rather to more questions. For example, if I do want to implement this taxation, how is it going to be designed? Who are the taxpayers and what are the ranges uh, to be to enjoy exemption and this is what Rodrigo will elaborate more on and to complement this landscape I'm going to speak about the discussions in the US and the UK in the US recently what we have seen is the proposition from some senators to implement the wealth taxation but this is very controversial and discussed. And recently, Avi Omar with the polemic about tax, say, taxes on wealth, he said tax on wealth it truly is something complex. And why does he also say it's complex? Because most of the wealth of M Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, stocks of those companies trade on the stock exchange to market it's non pay in income and in the USA there was a recent ruling on more case it said that we cannot tax non pay in income is what professor Midis brilliantly showed as non pay in income is not taxed so aviona what does he say implementing a uh, tax on wealth it's highly complex and he suggests is a reform on tax system and his proposal on three pillars for this reform increase the corporate tax from 21 28 percent and tax 
taxation of known and realized appreciation. He suggests those cases you have as an example, someone with an asset that's too high, huge leverage on shares and stocks, high market value, the realization immediate would only happen if this person gave as warranty for this asset in order to have a to borrow. In this case, you would have the conditioning, the taxable circumstance for this value that was not, was not yet taxed. And finally, due to legis American legislation problems, and he suggests that uh, they not uh, to levy taxing on donation and inheritance. And to wrap up the global position, I will present you and share about the UK. In UK, we had a study, wide study, in fact, after COVID, involving counselors, economists, those is studying social science, British government, and several reports arising from it. They analyzed what would be more efficient to have a taxation on assets. They call one off, one off, no one taxation. Similar with what we did when the we he when we repatriated assets abroad and not reincident to just tax once or doing a taxation on a yearly basis. What study suggests it would be better to have the one off tax? And why the study reaches this conclusion? Because it's focus on collection efficiency and the cost to collect. In this case, the obvious conclusion is tax once, one off. And on the other hand, and if I want anyhow to reduce inequalities, would it be possible through one, uh, through yearly taxation. There are some questions arising from this because when you when impose yearly taxes, you cannot foresee effectively what will be the behavior of taxpayers. Furthermore, in, in, in addition to behavioral issues, people might leave the country, you have evasion, tax evasion. So they thought this would be difficult. What would be an effective collection? So. Today, I pass the floor now to Rodrigo, who will add relating to all these aspects of the Brazilian landscape. So thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. First, I would like to thank, say my thank you to all of you here with us, rendering prestige to this event, but also all those that took part in the organization of preparation, contributing directly, placing efforts and burning their stem cells. So I congratulate the table on the person of Dr. Tatiana. And with no further ado, not to lose sight of things, Isabel presented and shared a landscape pointing towards possible conclusions that will be soon confirmed, which are taxes on wealth. It's a tax with huge difficulties, not only on the practical side regarding the design, choices to be made to comply with the tax, and especially regarding the core cost versus the benefit of implementing this type of taxation. Well, with this, how are we regarding Brazil today? In fact, there's a call to tax wealth everywhere worldwide. Depending on how the question is posed, the answer will be always pointing to a direct. Is anyone here in favor of pollution, so a tax on mitigating pollution is welcome. And in a way, when we talk about tax on wealth, what we want to do, it's the principle of paying more, pays more who can economically wise. This will bring us a need to reflect again 
if this tax would be the best way to reach this purpose. Brazil, not different from the rest of the world. Our system, capitalist system, the economic uh, in force regime worldwide contributes for towards this process of accruing wealth. So this is a data from the problem. It's not new and this will not guide the decision. Nevertheless, it this argument has been used in order to develop the idea of creating a tax on wealth. The idea of inequalities, and as such, it's bad, obviously, because it leads to problems and effects worldwide. It leads also to the idea we must have a way to control wealth concentration. Do you think this tax will solve this problem? I.e., it seems there's a misalignment between the purpose, target, that's in the agenda and what truly will be reached with the implementation of this time of type of tax. Mismatch between measure and purpose must be addressed in a way and this will cause us to reflect and conclude about if it's appertaining or not to have this tax. Brief comparison now of Brazil and other countries of Latin America and also regarding OECD pointing out our tax burden represents an important chunk of the GDP. It's well known our tax burden equal to first world countries, let's say countries in a advanced development compared to ours. Again, this is not what will make the decision to implement the wealth taxes per se. This will not define, but it indicates that our system is one that is a burden, heavy burden of those who are producing. If the tax, good tax system must be, must look for a situation of respect to our all are equal before the law and all those attributes that economists like to list neutrality i i am concerned about this because i think neutrality is something on topic taxes will affect prices and the market will accommodate itself in order to face a new tax burden so if a good design of tax system takes this into account, these elements I listed, we have options regarding income, saved, generated, consumes, leading to different facts of tax generation. But tax on wealth as foreseen by our constitution in Article 153 is the competence of the government, it was never established, not for different reason, which is the difficulties or difficulties existing regarding the choice of this method for taxation. We have taxation on income, classic one, which is the traditional way and immediate when we talk about tax law to gather resources for the state. We have tax on inheritance, donation, as a way also to capture wealth regarding properties, real estate. So there are means to tax, but the issue is to think, can we improve it in order to reach a design for tax system that will lead to reduce problems regarding those faced by the state challenges per se and needs regarding the aiming towards public interest so reduction of inequalities will not be done priority through tax there are other mechanisms of public policies that will reach this result. 
so this is something that will be confirmed when we start to think about what would be a tax on wealth in Brazil. And it starts with what's wealth in Brazil? How to define what's wealth? For me, it could be one million. For other person, might be 10. Or Zuckman, it could be one billion dollars. But, and what? Will we reach horizontal equality and vertical horizontal at the same time with the threshold which is in a higher level? And also those with a high capability of paying taxes, they don't pay because they have uh, assets which is a bit reduced. These are the points that might happen when we talk about progressive or tax income. But at least there's a coherent system searching for reaching minimally the tax paying capability during this time. So with this, I must know what is wealth that's susceptible to be taxed. The tax event, the rate, I'm sorry, the rate, and how will a val valuation of assets. One of the issues when you have the idea of taxing wealth, it's the alleged by report, those advocating this idea that income, or better say wealth, ends by allowing deferred taxation because the wealthy people worldwide, they have stocks and shares of big companies. If we get the most rich bracket worldwide, they hold tax and shares of big companies. And unless they sell and trade them, they will not incur in gain taxes. They might receive dividends, but they might defer or not apportion it and reinvest profits generate this issue is that there will be a deferred of taxation on wealth taxes will have to overcome. On the other side, I would say, well, if we are talking that taxation on income in a way, and here I'm talking about product of capital and work depends on realization. I'm against the idea the realization when I have a taxation on presumed assets. I can argument like this in order to fight against the idea of wealth taxation. But going back to the idea of valuation of assets, I will face huge difficulties in order to how to evaluate Will I deduct liabilities, debt, how to evaluate different assumptions of different assets? It's not obvious, it's not simple, uh, nor easy to reach. And then we have uh, aspects regarding to the territori territoriality and worldwide basis taxation, the assets in one country, or all wealth one has obviously where they are located. This also is a point very important. And also by reason of election of criteria of connection to the land in a country to justify taxation, we have the evasion. So France in 013, 11, when reestablished tax on wealth ended by there was the millionaires of the countries, they run away, run away and they didn't want to pay more. They did not agree once they had an existing how high tax in the country. So this is an evidence that depending on how this tax is established might generate outcomes in the sense that taxpayers will look for different jurisdictions looking to cancel their residence in the country and go to a different country. And then someone says, that's why we are doing, trying to do within the scope of multilateral international movement. So all countries adopt at the same time. So it's difficult, this planning. You're right, it's a fact. But do you think countries will adopt the same threshold? This is the danger. The proposal talks about billionaires beyond one billion dollars. We will have few taxpayers in Brazil, we know. But other countries, we will have a 
bigger group. Uh, does it make sense all this effort to create a taxation like this for an outcome that will not be that significant? So these are issues that we lay down, political aspects, ideological aspect. Here in Brazil, we have a direct action of unconstitutional not constitution due to omission by the social party in Brazil, not yet judged by the STF court. And this is to force the federal unit to establish IGA. Why would not establish? The objection is this, and simultaneously regarding legislative initiative, we have several bills, hundreds of bills earmarked for looking for the creation of this type of tax. Well, Evading a bit the idea how this tax should be defined and now think about our system. We are experienced now a time of reforms. The idea is to show, do you think we really need IGF? Well, we had the constitutional um, amendment 132 with the purpose of reforming the consumption taxation, but it also entered in the merit of setting forth and imposing progressive taxation on donation and inheritance of taxes. Furthermore, we had the forecast on a clear way regarding criteria to tax on the by the same tax on heritage and donation, international scenarios where the assets are abroad, the do donor and donee are in Brazil, the, the hair is in Brazil, but the inventory takes place abroad, international scenarios in situation on an overall. So what we see is an improvement, improvement of the system to better capture the taxation through this way. We had, by the end of last year, the addition of the law 1474, in addition to the trust situation dealt by Ricardo, also established a rule, CFC for individuals. In fact, it's a CFC rules for individuals, but it went a bit beyond because it levied tax automatically on profits of controlled companies abroad for individuals residing in Brazil control this directly or indirectly held and legal entities offshore in tax haven or those with favorable tax system. And simultaneously, this is applied also for controlled companies. Although they are not located in tax haven, it has an active income own income below 40%. So this results in, uh, we have a system that will capture in a better way, like it or not. We have concerns regarding if it's legal, constitutional, these provisions that will capture a bigger chunk of wealth that might be dealt or not realized or deferred unduly or abusively allocated abroad to avoid in taxation in Brazil, and that doesn't matter. Now, regarding ETCMD, we can see on the project of complementary law that regulates the reform. In the infraconstitutional level, we see different measures that are being placed, approved in by the chamber in order to close, let's say, loops of tax planning regarding inheritance and donation taxation. Example of this disguised profit apportion amongst those linked or in a way related and or the setting forth of taxation for uh, debt forgiven or many other debts that show the appetite of the state or the intention of the state to improve the taxation scheme in order to have a higher collection on wealth. So within this landscape of reform, this shows uh, that we have been going through changes. Like it or not, we have been proven our system. 
despite all their criticism or compliments. The fact is that we have to see all of this, and based on that, ask, do we need tax, uh, wealth taxation after all of this? Is it really necessary for us to have this additional way to tax wealth? Are we going to reduce inequality based on this uh, tax mechanism? These questions must have an answer, and in a serious way, because otherwise, this is just uh, an ideological matter. This is just an instrument that does not really make you achieve the goal that is really the one that drove people to implement this tax. In the international experience of that this is very complex and low revenue based on this. There are many valuation issues involved. So how can you value taxes? And in terms of horizontal vertical equality, it's not really achievable. The issue of residence, as I said, if we have a unilateral initiative, we may have a margin for better planning, and people can just leave the country and so on. So by and large, we have to wait a little bit without having all this excitement on the reform institution and so on. We have gi to have give time to time and see if these measures will really generate good revenue and whether we can really implement all of these measures adequately and if other public, public policies can also lead us uh, to reduce inequality. Another issue that has nothing to do with uh, li a tax law, but somehow was addressed by Professor Maria in his talk, is the following. We have to look at the other side of the equation. Tax is not only the only solution to this. We also have to see how money is spent by the government. If we do not do that, we'll just be discussing technical aspects of taxation, but money will never really be used for the wished purposes and just be properly used by the state in order to give way to the initiatives to benefit the society. Now, as I have asked this question several times about inequality because it does seem that wealth taxation would not end with inequality. The idea of uh, waiting a bit to see the effects of our tax reform seems to be something necessary and more prudent. The red flag showing that what is really a wealth if it is from the multilateral perspective uh, established at one million, one billion dollars, this will not really be a big concern and would not really require us to analyze the situation more because this is a very small number of taxpayers. But if Brazil insists on this type of idea and then establishes wealth at a very low level, of course, this will require more planning or adjustment made to other, th other measures involving the tax general taxpayers. Well, I think that I spoke more than I planned, but somehow this uh, topic is really a passion, more in the sense that, you know, we should criticize it in a very constructive way and think the tax system in a broader way. And I think that we should use the less rhetoric that sometimes is what really guides this type of initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rodrigo. And Professor Lucas, France has this the experience of Decades and since the 1980s, they have taxed uh, wealth of residents. And in 2017, under Macron's administration, 
went through a reform that reduced uh, the scope of uh, taxation on wealth. As a paradox, uh, President Macron was one of the first ones to support the initiative of the Brazilian government in the G20 meeting held in February with regard to the implementation of a gl minimum global uh, taxation for the wealth. So my question is, how was this? And what are the big controversies in France with regard to this? Because you've had the case of experience with uh, wealth taxation. And why in 2017, the French government is still uh, supporting the idea and have sought this kind of uh, taxation? Uh, thank you, Fernanda, and uh, uh, I will uh, definitely refer to the Macron paradox at the end of my presentation to, to answer that riddle. Uh, yeah, so uh, France has an experience with wealth taxation, I mean annual wealth taxation for the good and for the bad uh, over the last 40 years. Uh, now, uh, probably uh, we would need to replace that this annual wealth tax in the context of French wealth taxation. In France, where we talk about wealth taxation, we basically talk about the annual wealth tax, but also about the inheritance and gift taxes, and also about local property taxes, actually, which are also a form of uh, 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 property, wealth taxation, but, but they do not target in any specific way uh, high worth individuals, so I will just leave them aside, but they actually, uh, local property taxes, uh, raise more revenue than the uh, inheritance and annual wealth tax combined. So, uh, as shown in my previous contribution, uh, with the rates going as high as 45 and 60 percent, inheritance and gift taxes are a very, very um, important issue in, in France and have a financial impact on taxpayers, which is important. And they are also a, a non-negligible revenue raiser for the uh, for the state. So the uh, inheritance gift tax represents like together 15 billion euro a year in, in on average, which is not um, uh, which is yeah it's 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 quite a lot in the French um, in the French budget. But you have to relate that to the total tax revenue in France, which is one. Uh, 1,150 billion euro a year, and, and, and then you can see that in any case, wealth taxation is an add-on to uh, consumption and income, and income taxation. So for the last four years, uh, 40 years, the most characteristic feature of the French system was the existence of an annual wealth tax. And, and by the way, to, for me, it still exists uh, because the new tax is not that new, actually, and it is the old tax with, with the, with the uh, taxable base uh, being reduced just to immovable property. So uh, that annual uh, uh, wealth tax was established, as, uh, as said by, by Isabel, uh, in uh, 1981. In 1981, uh, by uh, the left-wing government at that time of, uh, under President François Mitterrand under the name of tax on, on great fortunes. Then it was abolished for two years when the uh, right came back to power, 86, and then re-established 1988 under the, uh, the new name of uh, Sol Solidarity Tax on Fortune. And Solidarity, it was political marketing to say that, uh, to, to, to highlight that the revenue from the tax was uh, attributed uh, in the budget to finance a minimum subsistence uh, income for the poor. There was obviously a paradox uh, to some point with this tax because it was established uh, to some extent, extent against the tide of history at the beginning of the uh, Reagan-Thatcher era and in fact, France established uh, the tax very late in history and kept it after uh, while other countries abolished it. And it was uh, highlighted by Isabel uh, in her presentation. So in 1981, almost all European countries, except for the UK, had an annual wealth tax. And since decades, 
But as of the 1990s, most of them have abolished it, even the very progressive Sweden. And uh, today, uh, yeah, so uh, as said, only Spain, Switzerland, uh, I think Greece as well and Norway have still an annual um, wealth tax on indi individuals. So the tax was abolished in France 2017 with the arrival to, uh, in power to power of President Macron and, and replaced with a more limited uh, tax on immovable, immovable wealth, but which actually carries forward most of the features of the old uh, wealth tax except for the base. So, uh, as uh, well highlighted before, uh, this tax obviously uh, concentrates probably 50% of political debate in France about taxation, uh, but it has never been a revenue raiser. Uh, so, at, at best, the old, uh, larger uh, wealth tax uh, raised 5 billion euro a year, and the new tax raises actually 2.5 billion so you can see that it is not really um, an abolishment of the old tax, but a uh, reduction, rather, of its, of its scope. Uh, I think the experience of France shows, first and foremost, the difficulty uh, uh, to establish uh, such a global tax, annual global tax on total wealth. So to state some basics, uh, the 1981 tax was a tax paid every year by an individual on the net wealth assessed on January 1. So it, it is as if a taxpayer needed to uh, compute the tax on his own inheritance each year. Uh, the, uh, this was basically the, um, the way it worked. Uh, and French residents were taxed on a worldwide basis while non-residents only on the assets uh, uh, in France, located in France, and tax treaties would generally apply, the income tax treaties would apply to the fortune tax um, with um, uh, important consequences. Uh, however, and this is my point, uh, as of, uh, as of uh, 1981, some very significant exemptions were introduced for different policy reasons and uh, were exempt from the very outset, uh, among others, works of art, works of art in order to keep the collectors in France. And most importantly, there's always been an exemption for the so-called professional, professional assets. And, uh, and that's an important one. The professional assets, uh, in, in the sense of this tax, bien professionnel, uh, were assets necessary for business activity of an individual. So if the business was run as sole pr 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 proprietorship, uh, the, it was you know, the, the property, plant equipment, inventory cash of the, of the business. But more importantly, it also covered shares in a company in which the taxpayer would exercise his business activity. Uh, now the exemption dependent, depend, uh, dependent conditions, which became a major point uh, of attention in practice. Uh, a, a French professor Cousion has uh, brilliantly you know, summarized uh, the three conditions under uh, a formula saying that the taxpayer had to be a director, a capitalist, and well-paid to be able to get the exemption for shares. So the taxpayer had to uh, occupy a direction function in the company of which he would hold the shares. Uh, he would need to be a capitalist in the sense that uh, uh, he uh, had to hold at least 25% of the capital of that company but that condition could be waived if shares represented at least 50% of the assets of the uh, taxpayer and then well paid, uh, uh, the compensation from the company uh, had to exceed 50% uh, uh, at least of the total income of uh, active income of the um, uh, taxpayer. So probably if Elon Musk were a resident of France 
uh, he would not pay the wealth tax on his shares in Tesla, in, uh, even in 1981. Um, and at the end of the day, in practice, well, this tax was levied on real property, on cash, and on shares non-eligible for the, uh, uh, the professional assets exemption. So it was ironically said that this was a tax on millionaires, but not on billionaires. And how, but we can understand why this exemption was introduced, obviously. Uh, it was not to uh, impair the um, uh, competitivity of France you know, over a, a certain level. Uh, now, another big question that arose from the operation of the tax was uh, whether it could amount to an indirect form of confiscation. So uh, the tax was, uh, is paid uh, 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 only if the net wealth of the taxpayer exceeds 1.3 million euro, and then you have a taxable, uh, taxable uh, schedule, tax schedule with the progressive rate system and the marginal rate of 1.5% uh, of uh, taxable assets above 10, 10 million euro. However, you should always re relate the rate, I think, of the wealth tax to the average uh, return on capital in an economy. So, for example, in the 80s, the marginal rate was more like 4%, uh, but at that time, inflation stood at 15%, and uh, a savings account was, you know, uh, raised 15% interest for the taxpayer. Uh, so perhaps that 4% rate was less burdensome than a 1.5% rate in um, a, a low inflation uh, uh, environment. So the, uh, the big question is, and was and still is, by the way, should the tax system establish a relation between the wealth tax and the annual income of the taxpayer in order to respect the constitutional principle of ability to pay? And that was a question which uh, popped up uh, a lot in the French uh, uh, debate, but also in case law of the Constitutional Court. In 2005, the right introduced a mechanism called the direct tax cap, bouclier fiscal, the tax shield, according to which the annual um, uh, amount paid in income taxes, local property taxes, and the annual wealth tax should not exceed 60% of taxpayers' annual income. And if it did, taxpayer was uh, entitled to a refund from the Treasury. In 2007, with Sarkozy, the cap was lowered to 50% of income. The Constitutional Court said that this mechanism was not only conform with the Constitution, the ability to pay principle, but it was actually a good one, a virtuous one, uh, helping to achieve uh, the objectives of the, uh, of the Constitution because a confiscatory taxation would defeat the ability to pay principle. But the, the judge nev never said the rate of the cap, he just said Parliament made no error of appreciation in fixing the, the cap rate at 50%. Then came the financial crisis in 2011 eight, nine, 10, and 11. And, uh, and under Sarkozy still, uh, the tax was reformed. The rate was decreased to 0.5%, the marginal rate, but uh, at the same time, the direct tax cap was abolished as not being useful anymore, according to the um, legislator. But one year later, uh, 2012, the left wing returns to power and under uh, President Hollande, the old rates of the wealth tax are re-established, but without re-establishing the cap, the direct tax cap. And the Constitutional Court again, uh, again is um, uh, asked for a, a ruling and uh, it, uh, it rules in August 20, uh, 2012 that a direct tax cap is not only constitutional, it is mandated by the Constitution. There must be some cap vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis income. And after that, the, uh, the left-wing government enacted a new but much less advantageous cap, which is still in force, 
and which says that the amount of income taxes and wealth taxes in France should not exceed 75% of taxpayers' annual income. And the Constitutional Court say, said it's okay. So this, uh, in December 20, uh, 2012, at fixing the rate at 75%, the legislator was reasonable. And finally, the big reform came after President Macron came to power 2017. So the, 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 the ESF, the, the, um, the old wealth tax was abolished and replaced with the tax on immovable wealth. Again, materially, it is not a new tax. It is basically the old tax with its base limited to real estate. So the exemption for professional assets remains the territorial scope, worldwide principle, thresholds, rates, the cap remains the same. Uh, just one minute. Now the stated objective of the reform was twofold. One, uh, to deal away with the major problem which was associated with the old tax, where important shareholders, non-eligible for the uh, uh, bien professionnel exemption, were incited to leave France, sell their shares generally to uh, American pension funds, and transfer cash abroad. And the second objective was to uh, direct savings towards shares rather than towards uh, real estate, which is the best investment in France, generally for most, uh, most French uh, taxpayers because the, uh, it is considered by, was considered by the legislator that real property is an, a non-productive capital. Well, what was the impact of this reform? Uh, there was a very tangible first impact. Many tax lawyers had to find another specialization, uh, was the first one. But the second one, uh, uh, more seriously, is that uh, the reform seems to have had some impact on taxpayers' mobility. Uh, namely on the tax flight. So we have data from the uh, tax administration uh, and uh, between 2000, 2011 and 2016, it concerns the old wealth tax taxpayers. Uh, the number of departures from France of such taxpayers was about 950 a year a number of returns was like 370, resulting in a negative balance of 600 departures of high net worth individuals uh, uh, taxable to the wealth tax. And after, uh, after we, have a, we have data for the EFI taxpayers, namely the taxpayers of the new, uh, new tax, and, and now we have a positive balance with more, more returns than departures of, 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 such, uh, of such taxpayers. Now, and I will conclude with that, uh, it's still a big issue in France and many important political parties plead for the return of a more robust wealth taxation. And then I will re refer probably to the paradox of Macron that uh, Fernanda referred to. I think the problem is not having a wealth tax a problem is being the only country in the world having one. And if all countries introduce one, then you don't anymore have a problem with competitivity. Thank you. Muito obrigada, professor. Thank you, professor. So we wrap up due to the time. We won't have time for more questions. We, I thank again the time and the members of this panel for the rich and full of details debate that certainly will help us to reflect further within the scope about taxation. Uh, aiming towards more equality in the future because we in a government university and in a congress developed by IBDT that was always instigating debates and qualifies so much high qualified professionals that bring to Brazil 
from uh, the knowledge from abroad uh, and IBDT will survive all of us is now celebrating 50 years we will be permeated by the debate in this panel regarding efficient and fair progressive taxation that will meet social demands now in the future I pass the floor to Tatiana chair of the table so she formally can wrap up this panel and thank you for your presence well I would like to congratulate the, uh, the lecturers for the rich debate. The rich debate, the word rich is sort of a concern. Well, bear in mind what we were talking, but I thank the attendees that is very concerned, as I see, regarding the taxation on wealth. And probably, and especially, I believe that the concern is also on Professor Schwedis because according to yesterday lectures, Professor Schwedis charges millions. Uh, and he pay attention to the movement regarding international scope debates, considering that, as Dr. Isabel mentioned, regarding the statement approved by G20 with the study by Zuckman, and now within the national scope regarding TLP 108 that stress the regulation of IGF for those with more than 10 million, i.e. a rate 0.5 to 25, 1.5, 25% with more than 80 million. And also call the attention TLP 108. We will be, there's an attribution for the states to decide what's a wealth for the enforcement of a higher uh, rate of I IPCMD, which now it's 0.8%, per where there are projects by resolution of the Senate dealing with the intention of a rate of 16, 20, 25 percent. Now, because of time constraints, I would like to th thank you and declare that this table is closed. Thank you very much.